your uh, new book um, is, is about uh, the, how the West was lost 50 years of economic folly and the stark choices ahead, um, which I think is another good starting point for, you know, where do you think we, are, we stand now and uh, what is going to happen to us into the American dream, which will be restored by setting good examples, Ariana, not, not you know, <laughs> giving in to uh, pressure. Well, um, I guess the, the, the worst, uh, worst thing about being the last person to speak is that everything's been said. Um, but being an economist, I'm going to sort of recast it um, in the way that I, I talk about it in the book, but also in the manner in which I see it. And first of all, I must say again, with all uh, due respect, I, I do think that uh, the, the financial sector has been over, overused as a scapegoat in this situation. And there are lots of reasons for that, and we can come back to that later. Um, from the economic lens, we tend to look at economies using three basic ingredients. And I liked what was said earlier about, we, in a sense, we have to go back to basics. Um, and we basically know, after 500 years of data on how countries and uh, economies grow, that the three key ingredients are capital, their labor, and total factor productivity. And the reality is, in the United States in particular, but across Western, uh, Western Europe in general, these three things have been misallocated, um, certainly over the past 50 years. And I think the main argument in my new book is that they've actually been misallocated because public policy has supported a, um, uh, a overly um, bad investments in these different sectors. So let me just quickly give you some examples, and I like what you said a moment ago. Um, if you look at the housing sector in the United States, it's very easy to say, oh my God, you know, it was the banker's fault and um, perhaps overly focus on what has happened in the past few years. But actually, this is a, the, the sort of most recent step in what I would consider a systematic decline in the United States and the erosion of the capital base in this country because of bad policy. In particular, the policy that was alluded to a moment ago, which is the housing for all policy. It simply cannot be the case that a country should be providing housing um, to a population that cannot afford it. And we've obviously come to realize that now. But I think to focus on the banks and not to accept that it was a confluence of factors, in particular the fact that you had baby boomers, you had um, the government established Fannie, and Freddie Ma uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac institutions, but also you've had a period of long-term low, uh, low interest rate environment. And the three of these things together kept the um, housing market much higher than it actually should have been. Um, in the labor front, clearly things like pensions are misallocated, uh, mispriced options. Um, we've seen whole industries decimated in the United States because of a policy of encouraging pensions. That is not to say that we should not be coming up with clever and innovative ways to provide for um, older generations as people age, but certainly at some point we should be thinking about ways of solving the problem as opposed to kicking it um, forward, which is what has happened in the United States. Um, and then of course with respect to total factor productivity, although yes, productivity has improved in the United States and continues to improve, it's clearly quite sectoral. Um, and in that sense, um, there, I think there are a lot of fears certainly from my perspective, that there's overly, uh, over-investment in um, areas that perhaps do not have a, bright, a, a broad social appeal or benefit, such as high-frequency trading, for example, um, and that could be at the cost of investment in innovation in food security or um, in energy policy, which are things that obviously are desperately needed in this country. Um, to sum up, I would just say that what, where does this leave the United States, um, in my view? I think um, the U.S. has a, what I, I'm calling a Hobson's choice. Um, it can either stay open and sort of pursue a policy um, of trying to fix the current situation of the misallocation in these three ingredients by staying as part of the, of the global uh, community, which I think as somebody who does not come from the United States, I think that's what we would like to see. However, I think that the um, investment in education, um, as Obama uh, announced with the 3% of GDP, the investment in infrastructure, the 45 billion and, and subsequent um, other amounts, and other bits and pieces are simply not big enough to actually um, alter the path that this country is on right now. Um, and in addition, I think the whole strategy of trying to solve the U.S. problems, U.S. structural problems in the current context um, will not yield good results um, especially because they rely very much on the rest of the world playing fair. And we can spend a whole panel talking about the fact that it's unlikely um, that we're going to see countries like China play fair, um, certainly in exchange rate policy and trade. On the other hand, the United States could take the approach of becoming much more closed, 
um, closing off in terms of trade, in terms of capital movement, and really focusing, and maybe even just for a short period of time, on trying to redress the fundamental structural problems that the country is facing today. Um, I think that, unfortunately, for a lot of political reasons, and I do think that political myopia in this country has yielded some really bad uh, problems, the structural issues in the, in the economic sector, but I would say that I think that there's been um, such a negative association with uh, protectionism and issues around um, structuring, subsidizing certain sectors to the point that there's no, it's become such a fringe issue. So the notion of talking about uh, protectionism around the trade, uh, trade in the United States is sort of considered a Tea Party or very um, kind of Lou Dobbs um, discussion. And yet, if we are open-minded, and in fact, the University of Chicago, there have been some amazing papers that have come out. If we are open-minded and looked at the performance of Americans in terms of their income and in terms of income inequality in this country over the period where the United States has become more global in the past 30 years, um, you will see that Americans, on average, have not benefited as much as they could have from this society being as open. So I'll leave it there. I'm sorry, I've probably spoken more than I should have. But I mean, from my perspective, I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and it's not yet being done um, as I see, it, as see the case.